we got a big old crowd tonight, so glad to see everybody. Everybody doing well? All right. Well, amen. Well, we're on the brink of one of our biggest outreaches of the year, our VBS. So I know a lot of people showed up last night to help with that. So excited for that. That starts Sunday, correct? Where's Missy at? She stepped out Sunday night, and it runs through Friday. So we'll be telling everybody about that. we got a few announcements before we get started. Um, so VBS, obviously, is the big thing. And still, if you haven't got involved in wanting to help with that and you'd like to, there's still plenty of things we can sign you to do. So feel free. You can see Missy. You can see me. We can help you get signed up with that if you want to do that. But otherwise, just invite everybody that you can think of in the community. And let's just bring everybody out. We can share Jesus with them and give them some Bibles there, Jason, and uh, tell them about the Lord. So that's our goal. That, that's our assignment for this coming week. You guys excited about that? All right. You guys don't look too excited tonight. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you right up front this. So I'm staying like six feet from everybody. I think I'm fine, but just in case I don't shake your hand or whatever. So I woke up yesterday morning, and I had whatever is going around, I think. And then I woke up this morning, it's over with, but I spent 30 hours in bed. And so I'm a little weak, and I feel fine now, but just to make sure. So be praying for a lot of people out with that. As a matter of fact, Brother Wesley still continues to be sick with that or something. We don't know exactly what. They ruled out cardiac. He actually went to the hospital, and so he's back at home now. But they still don't really have it under control. He's feeling worse than he was. So continue to pray for Brother Wes. And Casey is out with some kind of crud, probably the same thing everybody else has got. So let's be in prayer for him. And let's just pray that all of us be back in in good health and ready to, to go to work come Sunday. Amen. All right, sounds good. All right, so uh, we're going to, because we got quite a bit going on tonight, we're going to abbreviate the prayer list. We're not going to read the whole thing like we usually do, but by all means, let's just remember the ones that are on this prayer list and especially the ones that we have on here for salvation. As always, I don't want to neglect that part. That's the most important thing in the world because we deal with health issues and we understand that. And ultimately, all of us are going to die. That's just the fact of being alive, that we're all going to die, and the Bible's clear that after this is the judgment. And so let's be much in prayer, more than anything else, for the salvation of those that don't know Jesus Christ. If we're in Him, if we love Him, if we've put our faith in Him for salvation, then we don't have to fear death, do we? may not be comfortable getting there, but we have no reason to fear that death because it's the beginning of something so much better. It's actually a blessing for us that know Jesus Christ. So let's be praying much for those that are lost. Does anybody, aside from the ones that are already on the prayer list, do you have unspoken requests for, for lost people that you know? Raise your hand if you do. All right, so let's be much in prayer for those. And like I always say, let's don't just pray that God will reach them somehow. Let's pray that God will give us the ability to reach out to them and share the gospel with them, that he'll use us as a, a bold instrument to take the gospel to the lost. So other announcements and prayer requests, um, and I'm kind of mixing things back and forth because I wrote them down in kind of random fashion, but don't forget our grow groups that meet each week. I'm sure none of them are probably meeting this week because of VBS, but they'll resume back up, and especially be in prayer for the one that just started in Sumter County, that it'll, it'll grow and we'll get a lot of people starting to attend that, and that we'll just make disciples and better disciple each other. Um, we're considering also a summer blast program. Uh, we're looking to see. We had a meet short meeting last Sunday after the the service and just to kind of identify who was available to help with that and we got quite a few people that seem to be able to do that so we're trying to pin that down so be in prayer about that if that's God's will that we put on a program for at least a few weeks during the summertime for our young people all right also on our prayer list that we usually have is uh the members of our church with sickness and and health needs and members of our extended family that aren't necessarily members of our church so before we go f any further, are there any other prayer requests that we have tonight that are urgent? Okay. Okay. Marky Eiley, let's remember him. Oh, good. Thank, let's be thankful for this, that he came through that surgery well. Quadruple bypass. Let's continue that he continue, pray that he continues to heal well. Any others? Well, 
All right. Brother, I have not. Has anybody heard anything about Brother Kenny? He went to the ER. I'll check on him as soon as service is over. Let's pray for him also. Any others? Patrick. Amen. All right, so let's remember this one. Any others? Okay. And let's remember Aunt Mary Lou. Whatever it is, it gets around quick, doesn't it? All right. Any others? If not, Jason, if you would open us with prayer and just remember these that are on the prayer list and for the services tonight. Amen. Okay, so tonight we're going to have a short lesson. Let's try to be done sometime around 7.30, and then we're going to do a prayer walk. Did everybody get this piece of paper as you came in? Did anybody get this piece of paper? All right, it's one. So Patrick's going to make sure that gets passed out. So what we're going to do tonight, yep, and if you can't walk, you can sit right there and pray. And uh, you, know, you can absolutely pray. So if you're not physically able to walk from room to room, because the way that works is we just, as soon as I'm done with the lesson, we'll dismiss from this part. We'll go room to room to room, and including the fellowship hall, because there'll be a class out there, and just pray for each one of those classrooms, the teachers and the students that are going to be there, that the, the gospel will be clear, the message will be clear, and that God will be honored in everything we do this week through this VBS. So... I say for about 20 minutes, we're going to have a lesson. We're going to break. We're going to go do the prayer walk or the prayer sit for Jason. And then once we're done with that, at 8 o'clock, come back into here. We've got a business meeting. And then uh, Jim says it'll probably be short tonight, right? Okay, that's what I was told, too. I'm not putting words in your mouth. I was just told that there is no old business. So we'll move pretty quick. All right. So tonight, if you will, turn with me your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. We're going to be looking at just a few verses. We're going to be looking at verses 22 through 25. And tonight I want to I want to ask two questions. The first question is the question that Jesus asks. And the second question is the question that the disciples ask. So before we get in our text and we get into those two questions, I just want to ask you a question of my own. Do you guys go through storms that sometimes you don't know how you're going to make your way to the other side as you go through life? All right, so we all do, and I hope that as we go through this lesson, we learn a little bit, or we're reminded, because I don't have anything novel to teach tonight, but I hope we're reminded of what it takes for us as God's people to get through these storms and bring honor and glory to God, which is our great responsibility. All right, so looking at the text, we start in verse 22. It says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. 
And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. So just a few things about that. I just want you to pick up every word of Scripture is important. So I just want you to look at the words that we see here in this text as we go through this. A few things that just jumped out at me automatically. And the first thing that I want you to notice is it came to pass on a certain day. And you guys are welcome to talk back a little bit if you like. But what do you make out of that, that it came to pass on a certain day? Does anything jump out at you about that? Does anything leap to your mind that it came to pass on a certain day? What? Yeah, so what did Jason just pray? That, God, you know everything. You're in control of all this. You're the king. You're the omniscient, all-knowing, all-wise God. Then nothing is going to catch you by surprise. So this event, this storm that these disciples get caught in, it happens on a certain day of no surprise to our master. So on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And you notice that Jesus went into the ship with his disciples. They weren't on a boat by themselves. They were in a ship with their Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And so he, said, he says, let us go over on the other side of the lake, and they launch forth. So at his command, they're in a boat with the Master at his bidding. They get into this boat, and they set sail for the other side of the lake. And Jesus is exhausted from his work because he's the Son of Man. So he's God in the flesh, and he suffered, and he endured all the things, including exhaustion and frustration and anything and everything that's common to us, temptations, you name it. Christ endured it because he came a, became a man so that he could be a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And so our Jesus, he's in this boat with his disciples, and he's exhausted, and he takes a nap as they sail on to the other side. And as they go, immediately, the Bible says, a storm of wind comes down on this lake. And this lake is notorious. It's a very deep lake. It's a freshwater lake. They often call it a sea in the Bible, but it's a very deep lake. And so it gets really tumultuous really quick when the wind picks up. And these were experienced sailors, a lot of them. They were fishermen that had made their, their livelihood on boats and in the water. And so this was no little storm. This was a horrible storm that comes to bear on this ship as Jesus sleeps in the boat. And the boat began to fill up with water. Has anybody ever been on a boat that was filling up with water? Yeah, okay, I see a, a head nodding back there. I can remember when we were young, and when I say young, I mean a long time ago. Like, I don't even know if my kids were born yet. I can't remember. But Brian and Betsy were with us. We were in the Keys. Chuck and Deanna was with us. And Michelle and her little brother, Ozzy, was a little guy. So if you know Ozzy, that'll kind of date this story for you. We went out to the reef off Key Largo to sightsee and look at the beautiful reef. And the sky was beautiful and clear. Everything was fine. So we go diving, and we're looking at the beautiful reef. And all of a sudden, somebody from above comes down and taps me on the shoulder because it's not that horribly deep. It's about 20 foot. So somebody snorkels down, taps me on the shoulder, and they're like, I'm like, okay. So I come to the top. Well, you know what it looks like in um, the, the Wizard of Oz where the sky turns yellow in the movie? Well, the sky had turned yellow, and the wind was howling. And we're in a ski boat because all of us are broke, and that's all we had. We had a ski boat. So it was a harrowing experience. I can understand what these disciples felt as this uh, storm of wind encroaches on the boat, and the boat begins to fill with water. And they're terrified. But Jesus is asleep. And as they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased and there was a great calm. Can you imagine what this looked like? Jesus asleep in the boat, this horrible windstorm. The boat's rocking and sailing. The waves are crashing over the top. It's filling up with water. And Jesus is asleep. Why? Jesus is asleep because he's on a mission. He's got faith that God is going to carry him to the other side. He experiences and he understands everything that these disciples are going through. So when he asks his question in a minute that we're going to get to, He's already experienced that. He's put his dependency on God the Father to carry him to the other side because he's not going to drown in the Sea of Galilee. He's on a mission to go to Calvary, and God's going to see it to the end. And so these disciples, 
they seem to have forgotten exactly what's going on, and so they're terrified. Jesus is in the ship, but they're terrified, and the, and the boat looks to them like it's going to sink. And the Bible says that they were in jeopardy. This was no joke. And so they come to Jesus, and, Master, Master, we're going to perish. And he stands up, he gets up, and I can just see him. The Bible doesn't give a lot of detail, but I can just imagine him getting up and looking and saying, okay. And he walks up to the, to the deck, to the top, and he looks out and he says, stop, peace, be still. He rebukes the waves. And it doesn't just slowly taper back down. In my mind's eye, it's, it's a raging sea and it's just billowing and crashing and it just goes, plume. And that sea goes as flat as glass because he's the master of the sea. He's the God of creation. He's the, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And nothing can conquer him. So the question that Jesus asks is, in response to all this, after he stills the sea, and you can imagine the relief of the disciples, but then Jesus asks him a question. He asks him, where is your faith? And I don't think he did this in a rebuking manner because, again, he's, he's our high priest. It can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He understands the fear that came into them. And I think he's redirecting them to remember exactly who he is and exactly how safe they are in him and how much he loves them. And so he, the question he asks is, where is your faith? He's asking this to disciples that are already in the boat. So he's not talking about the general world. He's not asking the world at large, hey, where is your faith? Why have you put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation? That indeed is important. But right now, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to Tuscanoga Baptist Church, and he's saying, where is your faith? You see, often in the Scripture, we see that we, God's people, we aren't carried. And a lot of, you know, I know stories in this church right now that are, that are amazing stories of faith where people are going through things. And they keep pushing forward for Jesus in spite of their circumstances, in, st- in spite of the storms that they're in. And always, in the history of Scripture, we find that God's people aren't, God doesn't take his people around the problem. God takes his people through the problem. Think about the Exodus story. God calls this nation of Israel, and they're immediately, pretty soon thereafter, their, their formation they wind up in the land of Egypt. They become slaves, and God delivers them from Egypt, and he takes them to the promised land. But he doesn't take them around. He takes them through the Red Sea. He takes them through the land of the enemy. He takes them into the promised land, but they go through the wilderness to get there. And so it is with us. God is with us, and he's taking us on a journey. And it's an incredible journey, and it's a journey that brings glory and honor to him when we do the only thing that we can do, which is exercise faith in Jesus Christ. That's so honoring to God. And so he takes us through the storm, not around the storm, because he's glorified in that. But when Jesus wasn't in view, when he's down in the bottom of the boat, when he's asleep and they're not looking at him, that's when faith for these disciples faltered. And that's when faith for us falters, is it not? When we take our eyes off of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we look to any device of our own, because I can just imagine these guys have got the bilge pump out, you know, whatever that looked like in that day, and they got the buckets, and they're doing everything they can. I just can't imagine these seasoned sailors are just sitting there watching and going, oh, my gosh, my boat is filling up with water. They're working, I'm sure, feverishly to fix this problem. But they've forgotten that the King of Glory is in the boat with them, and they're safe with him. He's going to take the ship to his, to his designated point. He's on a mission. But they've taken their eyes off of him for the moment, just like when Peter steps out of the boat in a story about the water that happens a little bit after this story, when Jesus walks to him on the water. And you remember the story of Peter as he's like, Lord, if that's you, let me walk on the water to you. And Jesus is like, come on, Peter. And Peter steps out, and everything's great until step by step he starts to look around and he sees the ravening waves, and he sees the the potential for death, and he sees the danger, and his eyes aren't on the Savior anymore, and he begins to sink into the water. And just like in this story, he calls out, and Jesus lifts him out of the water. So Jesus asked the question, where's your faith? But you know, faith, faith is only faith when the object isn't seen. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
think about that. That's kind of complicated wording until you just study a little bit, but then it starts to, to come to life. Faith is a substance. What is a substance? A substance is something solid, right? It's something I can put my hands on. It's tangible. It's for real. It's, it's got mass. It's got weight. It's, it's reality. So faith is the substance. This is the reality of things hoped for, and it's evidenced in things not seen. It's the substance. It's like, I can't see this. I can't see Jesus Christ myself. He lived and died 2,000 years ago, and he speaks to me through my heart, through the Holy Spirit, and through his word, and through the preached word. But I can't see Jesus Christ, and neither can you. But through the eyes of faith. And when we look at him through the eyes of faith, then that's glorifying to God. That's what God has asked us to do, is put our faith in him. And when we make that the belief of our life well and trust me when you put real faith in something when you really depend on something and you believe in it your actions reveal that belief do they not so when we put our faith in jesus christ our actions are going to follow suit and there's going to be evidence as it says here in this verse of that belief so faith is the substance the surety of things hoped for and it's the evidence of things not seen and faith is our only possibility for pleasing god the Bible says like five verses later in Hebrews eleven six, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith it's impossible to please God. Of these disciples, and then you can apply the question to us, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't ask these disciples instead of asking, Where's your faith? What if he'd asked them, Where's your power? What if he'd have said, where's your intelligence? Don't you have enough intelligence to come up with a formula to make this problem go away? What if he'd have said, aren't you clever? Where's your cleverness? Can't you come up with some trick or some device or some scheme to overcome this problem that's fixing to kill you? Maybe your stamina. Maybe if you just hold out long enough. Maybe if you just be stronger for longer, then the storm will calm and everything will be fine. But thankfully, there's nothing these disciples could do. Had Jesus said, where's any of those things or any other thing you could name outside of faith, what would they have been able to answer? Nothing. They have nothing. They're out of gas. We're out of gas without Jesus Christ, without faith. There's nothing we can do to resolve our problem of being separated from God by our nature and by our sinfulness. We can only be healed of that through faith in Jesus Christ. We can only please God through faith. So Jesus didn't ask any of those things, and he didn't ask that of these disciples, and he didn't ask it of us. But what he does ask is, where's your faith? What are you depending on? Are you depending on me? Are you looking at me, or have you lost focus, and are you looking on something else? And then there's the disciples' question. So Jesus asks his question, where's your faith? The disciples answer, what manner of man is this? Did you hear what they said? Where is your faith? And Jesus calms the sea. And they experience the power of God. And when through faith, they experience the power of God, the only response that's left for them is, what manner of man is this? Well, I'll tell you tonight what manner of man of this is. This manner of, uh, what manner of man this is, is the very Son of God incarnate that's come from heaven, that needs nothing, that's come to this earth because he loves us for reasons that only he knows because we certainly don't deserve it. And he's decided of his own, own volition to intercede in our disaster, in our sinking boat. He's come to do that for us. That's what manner of man he is. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords with all power and all might. You know what? That's the only thing these guys could answer because let me ask you the question. Describe Jesus. Tell me who he is. Yeah, that's good, Brother Bill. But it's so much more than that. And I bet that there's not anybody in here that can capture Jesus Christ by any kind of words. I am that I am. You're right. So they're left with this, and we're left with the same thing. What manner of man is this that's done this for me, that's got this power? What an awesome God that we have. What a wonderful God. So Paul writes in Romans ten seventeen. so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So obviously Paul 
this this comes on the heels of him explaining how salvation comes to us and how we become a child of God through through putting our faith in Jesus Christ and so he and through the preached word and so he sums it up with so then faith that we're talking about tonight it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so certainly that's for saving faith but it's also for sustaining faith see these disciples again I just refer you back to what we just talked about Yes, they're disciples. These are real followers of Jesus Christ. They're saved people. They're the church. They're the elect. But they've taken their eyes off Jesus Christ, and they're not putting their faith and their confidence in Him for the thing that's going on in their life right this minute. Yes, they have saving faith, but they're headed for disaster that they can't do anything about and don't really even need to be worried about because, like I mentioned a minute ago, what if we do die? Paul put it like this, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What if we do die? But we can be confident in Jesus Christ. He's going to complete in us what he, what he started. And so we are going to die. We are all going to die. But then it's going to be even better. But in the meantime, we're in the boat. We're in the sea. The storms are raging. But we're going to keep pushing forward. We're going to keep sailing forward until God's done with us, whatever purpose he has for us. And we can rest in that. And these disciples could rest in that. That Jesus isn't finished yet. He, he's in the boat with them. And he controls their destiny. So for saving faith, for sustaining faith. And again, when we see Jesus by faith, words can't capture the beauty that's there and the glory of Jesus Christ. He's a wonderful God, is he not? And we're just about out of time. So I'm just going to close it up like this. Our boat is definitely in jeopardy of sinking until we hear the Master's call and come home to Him in faith. I look around the night, and everybody in this room, I believe, has made a profession of faith. But if there's any doubt about that, if you haven't done that, then have you cried out for Him for salvation? If not, why not? He loves you. He's done everything for your salvation he's done everything that you can have eternal life that you can pass from death to life what a wonderful God but we have to respond to that call in faith have you done that and then for us in this room tonight I'm pretty sure all of us we are like the disciples we're on a journey with our Lord he never suggested that the sailing would be smooth people that say oh once you become a Christian everything's smooth sailing and it's a you know, this uh, prosperity gospel stuff? No, no, no. The Bible doesn't know anything about that. The Bible says that when we become a child of God, you can expect some rough times. You can expect some rough sailing. He that would live godly in Christ will suffer. That's what the Bible teaches. That's the reality of it. But he's going to see us safely through to the other time. And then finally, do you, like me, sometimes forget that he's in the boat? Does that ever happen to you? Faith produces works. And I'm going to read this because I don't want to mess this up. I thought about it for about five minutes, and that's about all my brain will sustain conscious thought. But I want to make sure I say it like I thought it. Faith produces works that glorify God and have eternal weight. Works without faith is sin. Faith without works is dead. And I'll just leave you with that to think about tonight. I thank you for your time and attention. It's 7.30, so we're going to have a prayer of dismissal from this part. Then we're going to go room to room like we talked about. We're going to do a prayer walk. I just would ask you, just fervently pray that God will bless each of these classes, the teachers, the students, and that he would receive the glory for everything that's been done in preparation for this and whatever the results are thereafter, that he would be honored and glorified by it because it's all about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then at 8 o'clock, you can take your time. You can do it in whatever order you want to. Don't forget the fellowship hall over here because there will be a class out there also. If you're not